Israel. Many South Africans today are asking about developed markets versus emerging markets. And I think that the term emerging markets are often used very loosely. How does South Africa fit into the broader emerging market context? Also considering the fact that Taiwan, China, South Korea probably make up, makes up the majority of the index. Should South Africans consider other emerging markets opportunities besides what we have to offer uh, at home base? Sure, thanks, thanks Frederick, and uh, hello to, to all the, the listeners out there. Uh, I think it's useful to make the distinction between what South Africa is and is the emerging market and what other emerging markets are out there. I, I would group South Africa together with the likes of Brazil or Russia as uh, being the three which are most correlated to each other. I mean, th there are other countries within emerging markets which are also quite correlated with South Africa, but they're very, very small in the benchmark. And, 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 and simplistically, these are the sort of commodity exporting countries whose economies and currencies tend to move in sync with each other. Now, when we first launched 13, 14 years ago, these were close to half the index uh, combined, all the commodity dependent countries. Uh, and, and today, because they've underperformed significantly for, for over a decade, they're now quite small. So, so South Africa, Brazil and Russia collectively are under 10% of the benchmark. Uh, whereas, as you said, China, South Korea, Taiwan make up close to 70%. And when you add in India, you've got almost 80% of the benchmark from these four countries. So as a South African investor investing in emerging markets, you're not simply doubling up on your, exist, your existing SA exposure. You are getting something quite different, uh, which then does argue for its inclusion in, in part of a diversified portfolio. Thank you, sir. Also, you're also saying through, through your answer there that the returns you get from the various emerging market sectors out and markets out there are not necessarily correlated to each other. Am I right in saying that? That's that's to a degree it's correct. Of course, I mean the East Asian countries do have a, a reasonable degree of correlation between each other, particularly the three that I mentioned, China, Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, they're all fairly developed economies now. Uh, they're all high saving rates economies. They're all uh, export dependence. So you will find that they will move in sync with each other. But importantly, because they don't necessarily move in sync with South Africa, they provide diversification benefits uh, for South African investors. And, and I think that's really the case. If, if you want diversity, uh, then investing in emerging markets is not doubling up on what you get in South Africa. And, and it's also because the sectors that you get exposure to are very different in emerging markets compared to what we have in, in South Africa. Now, I think the, the best way to look at it is how do you look at our sectors in this country and how developed they are compared to what you find in emerging markets. And then typically, you have very different sectors available to you uh, in emerging markets, and they're also at very different levels of development. The, the one uh, example which I think is very instructive is uh, if you look at the banking sector here, You've got four banks with 90% of the assets in the industry. If you go to emerging markets, it's a lot more fragmented. If you look at our clothing retailers, our food retailers here, you've got a couple of big incumbent players with the majority of the market share. So if you go to other emerging markets, you, you might not find that spending on a per capita basis is well behind South Africa levels, but you will find that it's much more fragmented. And so you've got more scope for the companies that are consolidating and will be the long-term winners to grow their earnings over a meaningful period of time. And, and ultimately, if you look at what drives share prices and returns for investors over long periods of time, it, it's typically the earnings that companies produce. So we do think there's great earnings growth opportunities in these countries over, over a meaningful time period. And that's why they're quite attractive for South African investors. Whereas if you look domestically, uh, you know, many of our, our companies have already gone through this cycle uh, and have consolidated the industries and are now trying to defend an earnings base, which is which is fairly high. Thank you, Sohail. So um, what would you say to typical South Africans that would argue that uh, you shouldn't waste your offshore capacity, especially investors that are limited by Regulation 28 uh, and can have a maximum of 30% invested offshore, uh, which is a scarce you know, resource if you, if you, within that context? Um, 
that they shouldn't waste that on on emerging markets, seeing that um, South Africa is an emerging market already. I think part of your first answer did allude to that, but maybe can you give us some uh, examples of sectors and businesses that you find um, out in, in the emerging market opportunity set that's vastly different to what the South African is typically used to? Yes, I, I, mean, I think the, the one high level of argument I would make against that is that emerging markets are under underrepresented in global indices. So if you were to take all your money offshore um, that you're allowed and invest it in a in a global type product, you would typically end up, and let's assume it was equity only, uh, an MSCI equity type product, which is the most commonly used global benchmark uh, that South African investors would have exposure to, only has around 15% EM exposure within that. Now, now if you look at what, what emerging markets make up in terms of global market cap, in terms of population, in terms of our overall opportunity set, we, we believe 15% is, is, is just not, not enough. Uh, you know, whether it's 30 or 40 percent uh, is ultimately up to the individual, but I, I do think 15 percent is, is is too low. So to to, to complement uh, global uh, product exposure, I, I do think you need some dedicated EM exposure to, to compensate for the shortfall. I mean, someone like China, a country like China, for example, their stock market is already the second largest in the world in terms of market cap, and yet China is 40 percent of the EM index. Uh, which makes it then only sort of five and a half, six percent of the MSCI equity benchmark, which is really, really underrepresented. So we do think that you will benefit from having exposure to an EM product uh, directly over uh, over over the long term. Uh, and obviously, how much that is depends on the individual and the, and their risk tolerance. In, in, in terms of examples on on things that you can't get in South Africa and in developed markets, I mean, there's. There's just many, many out there that are too, too numerous to mention. Uh, the, the Chinese tech space, I think, is probably one which is most well known. And the level of innovation there is astounding. So, so China's leapfrogged many of the developments you saw in developed markets. If you look at, for example, e-commerce, China already has the, the largest e-commerce market in the world. Uh, and the e-commerce penetration is two and a half, three times that of the U.S. And, and, and why that is the case is because they don't have this really well-run, uh, great physical uh, retail infrastructure in the country, uh, which is competing against e-commerce. They, they have this history of having very poor retail offerings, a lot of department stores uh, being the main uh, mode of retail. And, and so e-commerce was able to leapfrog and move many years ahead of development. Whereas if you look at the equivalent in the United States, for example, you've got these big established incumbents like Walmart against whom an Amazon has to, has to compete. And so you've got a much more competitive environment. And in, in China, in the last 10 years, you've seen Alibaba, uh, JD.com, Pindyodo and a variety of other players, you know, just just constantly innovate, invest, build out their fulfillment infrastructure, uh, and bring retail that used to be risky uh, be offline uh, onto the uh, onto the online sphere. And and the earnings growth that is going to accompany that is is significant. And and these are a fraction uh, of the uh, of the benchmark. If you look at the MSCI Equi, and you're not getting exposure to them unless you take a dedicated EM manager. Uh, to complement your your DM exposure. So while you are giving us some examples, thank you very much for that. I guess it takes me to the next question, which is, uh, is there a huge difference in valuing businesses in emerging markets versus developed markets? Uh, also with the context that Coronation do have um, funds and strategies, both in emerging and developed markets, as well as obviously in South Africa, that we run. Are there differences in process, philosophy, the way you approach um, investing in emerging markets relative to or versus developed markets? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any difference in in either the process or the philosophy per se. The way we do things in emerging markets and in global is exactly the way we do things in South Africa, and that's that's looking at fundamental long-term earnings power of a business. And then what you should be paying for that today and comparing that to the share price. And then if something offers significant margin of safety, you buy it. And if something is looking expensive or overvalued, you don't, you don't buy it in your portfolio. So that, that core principle remains, remains unchanged. Obviously, 
the nuances differ from country to country because every country is different. So within emerging markets, you have those which have got a similar risk profile to South Africa in terms of cost of capital, in terms of the regulatory environment, in terms of protections for investors, uh, and then probably someone like Brazil is the closest peer that I can think of to South Africa. And then you've got the wealthier countries with better investor protections and more educated workforce and uh, more predictable regulation, and, and you're willing to pay more for a dollar worth of earnings from those countries. I suppose Korea would be an example there than you would for a dollar worth of earnings in, in South Africa. And then you've also got the countries which are riskier than South Africa with poor investor protections uh, and older populations and, and not as good demographics. And within that, I'd, I would put the, the likes of a Russia. So you know, a dollar worth of earnings from a South African company, uh, if you had the equivalent in a developed develop market, you'd pay more for it because there's more predictability. If you had the equivalent in one of the more mature emerging markets, you'd probably pay more for it, but you would pay less for it uh, in a place like, like Russia, for example, or in Argentina. So it really varies from country to country, and we take that into account in our valuation process. So when we're looking at the companies, we're looking at the opportunity set that's out there, we take that into account, and it's all embedded into the fair value we calculate for each company. And then thereafter, obviously, the risk profile of the portfolio will be dependent on the opportunity set. And, and we, we don't construct portfolios uh, which have got an excessive concentration of risks. So you're not going to wake up and see half our portfolio sitting in Russia, for example, because that's not an acceptable risk profile for, for any investor, let alone a, a South African investor. That was very useful, Sir Al. Thank you. And I guess what you also alluded to is why um, fund, a conservative fund like Balanced Defensive, as an example, would have much less or different emerging market exposure than, for instance, a fund like our Optimum Growth Fund, which will have a much more, much more aggressive emerging market exposure. The following question, Suhail alludes to, um, you know, many clients and their view on emerging markets and what they would say, what, what the catalyst would be to unlock all this potential in terms of emerging market returns for their portfolios. And I guess you will tell me that the word catalyst is not a word that we often use at Coronation, but how would you answer that question uh, from the end investor? You know, I think I said earlier that, that earnings growth ultimately will, will drive share price returns. If you, if you pick companies that grow their earnings year after year after year, um, and you buy them at a reasonable price today, you've got a good chance of making money uh, over uh, over the long term. And if you look at where the EM, as EMs as a whole are sitting today, we've only just got back to the high that they reached at the peak of the commodity cycle in 2007, which was just before we launched. So it's taken 14 years or 13 and a half years for emerging markets to get back to where they were uh, back then. And, and that'll tell you why I think some people are a little bit disillusioned with the asset class because your experience from investing in them uh, over the last 14 years hasn't been great. And they've lagged developed market returns significantly. But I, I think some context is important. A, a big part of the reason for that underperformance is because the commodity dependent countries like South Africa, Russia, Brazil, were much bigger in the benchmark then. And they've underperformed chronically over that period not just have the, the share prices underperformed because there was a very high commodity exposure at the peak of a commodity cycle, but the currencies have underperformed significantly. And, and the shift away from those countries towards uh, Asian countries in particular, I think gives you a better long-term earnings growth profile going forward. Because as I said, you've got many sectors where earnings growth can be very significant for, for many, many years. So a place like India is a good example. You've got a, a banking sector, which is still 70 or 65 to 70% dominated by state banks. And the private sector banks are taking market share year after year after year. Uh, that, that share was 90, 10, 20 years ago. And, and today it's sort of 65, uh, 35. And, and that, that gives you a good idea of how much earnings can grow in the in the years ahead. So you've got a banking system growing at 10% per year, and you've got the private sector banks taking share within that, and then you've got the highest quality private sector bank, like HDFC Bank, which we own in our strategy, 
which is growing at an even faster rate, and you're buying it at a reasonable multiple today. Uh, you know, I don't think you can get those sort of earnings growth opportunities either in South Africa, certainly amongst not amongst the very, very large companies. You might find a few examples in South Africa where you can get that, that level of earnings growth. The Capitec uh, 10, 15 years ago would have been an example. You, you're getting that today in emerging markets. Uh, and, and you're not really getting that in the developed markets outside of the of the tech sector. And there they are, we think the valuations in some cases are stratospheric. So you've got this good combination of very high earnings growth potential and being able to buy them at a reasonable price today, which I think is very attractive. And I think that will be, if you want to use the word catalyst, that will be the catalyst for returns uh, in EMs going forward. It's, it's these sort of companies here which have got a decade or more of very good earnings growth potential, and you're buying them at a reasonable multiple today. Yeah, so Al, thank you for for giving us some context around um, emerging markets and the opportunity set and how you value these these businesses uh, listed or or situated within these emerging markets. A further question that's perhaps pertinent and top of mind for our clients are around passive investing. And if these opportunities are so, so broad and vast, why would you say is it not just a good idea for our clients to just go buy a emerging market uh, passive tracker instead of our bottom-up valuation-driven clean slate portfolio? Yeah, I think I can see the temptation for a passive product, uh, but the reality is that our, I mean, our actively managed product has outperformed after fees uh, by a reasonable margin over a you know, 14 year period now almost. So I think we've shown ourselves capable of generating alpha over meaningful periods of time. So, so certainly uh, that is one argument for investing actively. But I think also philosophically, if you look at the, the, the breakdown of the EM index, uh, we've got a, it's certainly higher quality than it was when we launched the product many years ago when the large stocks in the benchmark were, were mostly the commodity type stocks and, and particularly the state owned uh, entities in places like China, Russia, and Brazil. Uh, th- those are less meaningful in the lives of the benchmark today, but it still is dominated by a couple of large tech players. So uh, Tencent, Alibaba, Taiwan Semiconductor Company, and Samsung Electronics you know, collectively are, are quite significant, more than 25, 30% of the benchmark combined. Uh, and then it becomes very dilute thereafter. So I think if you a high conviction manager, you can find opportunities which are minuscule in the benchmark today, five, 10 basis points or even nothing in the benchmark and invest in them. You've got a much better opportunity to generate alpha over meaningful periods of uh, periods of time. And also avoid, I think, some of the, the really poorer quality companies, which are still you know, reasonably uh, big in the benchmark when you add them up together. And those would be the state-owned banks, uh, the telcos and the commodity stocks, uh, which which are much smaller than they were many years ago, but are still quite significant in the benchmark. Yeah, just as a side note, so all the alpha generated, annualized alpha generated for the strategy since inception is 4.4%. So a very good outcome. Congratulations on that. And I'm sure our clients are also very happy with that. So I'll thank you very much um, for, for giving us a nice clear picture of the opportunity set within emerging markets. And it's obviously not that simple just to, to pick indices or sectors or, or regions um, to access some of these wonderful opportunities outside of South Africa. Just for our end clients, um, it's very easy to access these opportunities, not just through the Coronation Multi-Asset Funds, where we allocate to emerging markets on your, on your behalf, but you can also access the fund or this opportunity set directly via our global emerging market flexible fund that you can buy with your RANDs. Or if you decide to externalize your money and you want to access the fund with your hard currency, you can buy the usage fund, the global emerging markets dollar denominated portfolio. With that, thank you very much, Sahil. Keep up the good work. Uh, analytics, thank you for giving us the opportunity to produce this video for you. And to our end clients, we uh, we really, truly appreciate your support over the years.